Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. It is incumbent upon all of you to have a happy Mother's Day, because if you mess it up for her, right? So, so moms, uh, to you this morning, I hope and pray that you feel the love and the honor of your families today. But uh, regardless, that you will know deep down in your spirit, in your soul, that nurture and parenting is a stewardship that is of the Lord himself. It's a delegated responsibility from God himself. When the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply, he knew that men and women, husbands and wives would come together and have children, and that we would raise them in the knowledge and the love and the admonition of the Lord. And so it's a it's an important thing that you do, and it's a sacred rule to God that He's given you. And it's God-given, it's God-supported as well. And Pastor Steve prayed uh, with us about that this morning. So I pray God's wisdom and courage and strength on each of you uh, to parent well, and that's why we thank God for you today, and we bless you in His name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Interestingly, it is this, uh, in a spiritual sense, that we're talking about today out of our journey through the book of Acts. You can turn to Acts 19. What Paul is doing uh, with the relatively newborn church of the New Testament is he's mothering it. He's, he's building it. He's caring for it. He's nurturing it into maturity. And uh, it was Jesus who said at the Last Supper, this is the new covenant in my blood. And so through the, through the uh, apostles, God is establishing his church. And he's beginning with a new definition of who the people of God were. It no, would no longer be just the Jews, but it would be anybody who opens their heart and their life to receive Jesus. And so at this moment, he is in Ephesus. And so we pick up right where Chris left us off last week with Acts 19, verse 20. It says, so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. And I think there's an important context for the rest of our passage this morning in this. This is important because when someone is winning and prevailing, then someone is losing. And I don't know how many of you are good losers. Who here is a good loser? I don't mean that you're good at it. I mean that you, <laughs> well, maybe you're good at it too. I don't know. Um, but yeah, when someone's winning, someone's losing. And, you know, in, in those days, they didn't have emergency uh, alerts. Like how many of you have been getting those with on a regular basis on your telephone these days? And, and I'm so grateful for the technology. But there was a wildfire uh, spreading through the Mediterranean. And the wildfire was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people were aware that it was coming. They were aware that it had arrived in their city in Ephesus. And, and, and they were growing concerned about what its impact was going to be on their community. And I can't help but think that those th folks felt their community was as much under threat as we in the last week or so have felt in our community. We're afraid that this whole thing could get burned down. And that's exactly was the mindset that these folks had as the gospel was growing mightily and prevailing in their city. And so in Acts 19.21, it says, now after these things were finished. So these things, what are these things? Well, these things is everything that's happened in the book of Acts till now. So really quickly, the Spirit has been poured out upon the church, which invades first the Jewish world through Peter, John, and Stephen, and then it, it, it seeps into the Samaritan fringe, and finally the Gentile mission begins through Barnabas, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and it has been nothing short of spectacularly dramatic. The lame and the sick are healed. There are arrests. There are jail breaks. There are supernatural interventions, riots, beatings, stonings, and all of it is being navigated carefully, carefully by the people of God who are following the leading of the Spirit. And after all of these things begins the final section of Luke's epic history, which is from the birth of Jesus through the end and the birth and the maturing of the early church. And it will conclude in this section, and we begin this section of Paul's final journey to Jerusalem and to Rome. And so it says, after these things, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. And this is just a really simple little phrase, but it's kind of a unique phrase translation-wise. It's an interesting term that points to the partnership that exists, that, that, uh, 
that we've even talked about this morning, how important it is that we draw on the life and the strength of Jesus. And, and maybe the best translation of this could be, Paul made up his mind by the direction of the Spirit. Does that sound a little convoluted? So who was in control? Well, I think that's the whole point with relation. It's nobody's in control, but the Spirit led and Paul seized it and made that his choice and decision. And so he is going to go ahead. And so he sends Timothy and Erastus on, on their way. And then it says, about that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. Now, the way, of course, we know is Christianity. Now, the eastern part of the empire has really, from Jerusalem, has been, has been saturated with the gospel at this point. And Paul would write back later to the Romans. He says, I have no, there is no further place for me in these regions. In other words, as an evangelist, he's going, these guys have all heard. I am, I'm going west. That was his plan. That's where he's going. So he's going to revisit the churches of Macedonia and Achaia. He's going to take a, up a collection for the church in Jerusalem, which is under tremendous duress. And he intends to advance west and do the same thing he did at Antioch. He's going to establish a home base, and he's going to start evangel evangelizing in the west, uh, in Spain and in Italy. And, and he's going to launch that from Rome. And so that's why he wants to go there. Um, he knows there is serious hardship awaiting for him uh, in Jerusalem. But it was necessary that he go and he take an offering and he help the saints there. And you can read about uh, Paul's perspective as he's about to launch out if you read the chapter of Romans 15. But he says, keep me in your prayers as he's thinking about going back through Jerusalem that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. So he actually, in his mind, he's thinking, I'm going to, I may need to get rescued again. I don't know if it's jail or stoning or what it is, but just keep me in your prayers because you never know what's going to happen when you show up in Jerusalem and preach the gospel. And so before all of this is about to happen, something else happens. He doesn't even get out of Ephesus, and we pick up the story in Acts 19, verse 24. Luke says, dramatic, uh, in a dramatic understatement, he says, no small disturbance. Well, that's Luke's perspective. Let's hear it from Paul's perspective. He writes uh, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. He's talking about the people. <laughs> He's talking about the Ephesian people, the community. And I don't know how bad you'd have to be for me to think of I pastored a bunch of wild beasts in Grand Prairie. I don't know how wild and rowdy and how misbehaved you would have to be, but that's really quite a description. And so let's read the story. It says, For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with workmen of similar trades, and he said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends on this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with ha hands are no gods at all. When somebody's winning, somebody's losing. Guess which side Demetrius is on? Yeah, and he's not happy about it. And so not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. And when they heard this, they were filled with rage, and they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, and this chant goes up. The city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed with one accord to the theater, dragging along Gaius and Arista, uh, Aristarchus, you know, whoever, whatever, some guy. But these are Paul's traveling companions, and they're from Macedonia. And so they get caught up by this mob, and they're being drugged uh, to a, a, a picture, uh, an artist's rendition of, of the Temple of Artemis that we'll show you in just a little bit. And so Paul's life is in danger. And again, letting Paul reflect back to what these days were like, I think we need his perspective to understand what he was facing in, in Ephesus that day. He says, We were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death. So he actually is pretty sure that they aren't going to get out of Ephesus. He's not sure they're going to make it. And so this is, this is what Luke describes as 
no small disturbance. <clears throat> Thank you, Luke. So you'll remember Aquila and Priscilla that we've talked about. It says that they risked their lives for, for Paul, and this was probably where it was happening. But the events recorded here were centered not on Paul personally. He often was a lightning rod because of the gospel and the fact that he was such a spokesman. But this is actually on the gospel itself and on the impact that it has on, on Ephesus. People accepting Jesus was undermining the worship of the Ephesian idols. The named one is obvious, but the other one is actually an idol that is being worshipped in Grand Prairie today. And uh, maybe, maybe even maybe the reigning territorial spirit of our city. And we're going to get to that. Verse 24 names the goddess of Ephesus, Artemis of the Ephesians. But this isn't the huntress of Greek mythology that most of you, maybe when you think of Artemis, we were taught Greek. And how many of you remember from school the Greek and the Roman gods? And anyways, Artemis was one of them. She was a huntress. But this was, there was actually many goddesses named Artemis, and different cultures had their version of it. But this one, uh, the legend had it that her image had been fashioned in heaven and dropped out of the sky. The idol was a grotesque, multi-breasted woman. Happy Mother's Day. <clears throat> this is about the only connection I can make from our text to Mother's Day, and it's not great. So, um, but often, you know, in those days, meteorites would fall from the heavens and become sacred cult objects of worship. Uh, but there's another less obvious idol, and we need some context to identify it. And so, in this area, there has been, of course, civilization has existed here for a very long time, and they've over-harvested and they've not cared for their land very well. They've over-harvested it. And because of that, there's nothing to stop the water from running. And so the water and the rains coming off the mountains and running down the slopes is washing away the topsoil down into the rivers. And Russell, do you have that picture, that yellow one? So if you notice, I, I got this graphic because it shows the Great River. And if you look at the big one, and it's on the bottom, it goes all the way down to a place called Miletus. That used to be the main harbor along this shore, and it was a very huge, successful city. But its harbor silted in with all the topsoil that was washing out. And so if you go north, it's a little smaller river, but there at the end of it, right on the, on the edge of the water, is Ephesus. But now the same thing is beginning to happen to Ephesus. And so the primary source of income was beginning to change from sea and trade to religious uh, tourism, basically, is what it was. This was the place where the temple of Artemis had become a primary source of economic wealth and continued prosperity for the people of this region. There was a huge temple. It was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the world. Thousands and thousands of tourists would come to the temple every year, pilgrims, and and and. Around it, therefore, around this temple, swarmed all kinds of businesses. Um, and so it would be tradesmen, and they would profiteer. They would, they would leverage the devotion of people to Artemis to sell them uh, food and lodging, but also icons and souvenirs and statues that you could get right from the temple of Artemis itself. Uh, so, so revered was this place that merchants and even cities and kings would bring their money to be kept at the temple of Artemis, believing that this deity would actually protect their investment. And so this was not a small thing. This was big-time devotion. And when it affects your investment strategies, that's a big-time level of devotion. And so... It says that Paul preaching Jesus was turning many people from idolatry, apparently in such numbers that the craftsman Demetrius identifies that there's an economic culprit, and it is Christianity. It's Christianity that's cutting into their business. He was a shrine maker to Artemis and perhaps a guild manager because he's gathered all of the workmen together. Maybe he, he dispersed business or however that worked. And the statues, the figurines, the shrines, the amulets, the replicas of the goddess were in every home, and people would take them with them. And so Demetrius goes on the offensive, and he instigates a disturbance here. He is shrewd. He starts by talking with those who would likewise be upset with the fact that Christianity is cutting into their business. And then he moves on from that. He moves on, and he includes people who may not care about the the craftsman's bottom line, but they sure care about this identity. If Ephesus had become known as the place of Artemis, 
And so this is their whole identity. This is their whole culture. This is their whole economy. Everything revolves around the temple of Artemis. So, and it is here that Demetrius actually validates exactly what Luke had said. He said that uh, this Paul, who has been doing this all over Asia, is now doing it here. And what Luke said was the gospel was prevailing. And so he, Demetrius is actually uh, supporting that testimony. And so what's the response? The response is outrage. They spill into the streets with their loyalty cries, great as Artemis, great as Artemis, and the city is in confusion and in uproar. And a mob mentality kicks in. Have you ever gotten swept up in a mob? No? You've not gone rampaging through the streets, destroying cars, breaking windows, and looting? Okay, that's good. Apparently, you're not the wild beast of Ephesus. Um, but they've grabbed onto, onto Paul's companions, and they're dragging him along down the main promenade from the harbor to the temple. And so everyone is getting swept up in the noise in the profession. Russell, do you have that other uh, artist's rendition? So I'm sorry about the fuzzy at the t picture, but you can see on the top is the harbor, and all of this city, it has a promenade that leans all the way up to this spot, and in the, in the front and center, that's the Temple of Artemis. And so as they go through the city, this mob begins to, everybody starts going along. And, uh, and so the amphithe amphitheater that you look at at the bottom of that picture still exists, and the size of it shows that it could have held 7,000 more people than will crowd Rogers Place this afternoon or this evening to watch the Oilers play the Golden Knights. Let's just pause for a moment of prayer. <clears throat> <laughs> Rogers Place, and if you've been in there when the people are shouting, uh, my sons took me there for my birthday to watch the playoff game. That place is so loud. You know when the goal horn goes off? We couldn't even hear it. It was completely drowned out. You couldn't hear anything. It was just a din. And there was more people in Ephesus. There was more people in this mob. And I can't imagine what it was like. Verse 30 and 31, and when Paul wanted, Paul, it says, wanted to go in to the assembly, but the disciples wouldn't let him. He wanted to get into the middle of this whole mess. And by the way, he was the cause of it. And so, and, and it says the disciples wouldn't let him go in. Even some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So you kind of got to ask, what in the world is Paul thinking here? Why does he want to step into the middle of this mob and he's upset the whole city? Well, I think, number one, we recognize that Paul is absolutely fearless when it comes to the gospel. And he's loyal to his friends. They've been caught up, but he's going to head right back into the teeth of this mob. And, and I, I wonder what was in his mind. Maybe his Roman citizenship would protect him. Maybe he thought if he went in there, he could gain a hearing, and all this 25,000-plus people were going to actually hear him present his case for Christ. And maybe this would be a great revival. Have you ever looked at things through faith-colored lenses? You know, you, it drums up in it, and it turns out to be a little less than you hoped it would be. But you talked yourself into that it was going to be tremendous, it was going to be fantastic, and so off you went. And, and, uh, but no, uh, they wouldn't let him go in. Uh, he's been delivered from stocks. He's been delivered from prisons. God has been faithful to him. We sang that this morning. No matter where you are, Brian, let us in a prayer. No matter where you are, what place you're in, the Lord will be faithful to you. So maybe he just presumed that the Lord would deliver him. I don't know, but he's willing to go in there. And, uh, I mean, he's had extraordinary things happen. Miracles. Uh, a handkerchief that touches his body could be taken to a sick person, and they could be healed. So I, I think Paul lacked no confidence but, uh, but they wouldn't let him go in. And I'm just wondering, have friends of yours ever saved you from yourself? <laughs> Has anyone ever talked you out of doing something stupid? I hope so. Because no matter how stubborn you are, every once in a while, your presumption of faith, your presumption that this is the best thing and the best course of action is going to be the wrong assumption. And... and even the political leaders that had, were his friends and had probably come to Christ under his ministry in Ephesus over the last two years uh, are trying to keep him out of there. And I'd imagine Paul is a stubborn handful. He might have even been German if he wasn't Jewish. <laughs> I'm curious if you've ever noticed some version of this in our society. 
a feeding frenzy is what I would call it. Have any of you ever noticed a place where that sort of seems to happen on a regular basis? <laughs> Facebook <laughs> or wherever. Yeah, social media. Have you ever noticed the rhetoric on social media? The, way pe the things people are willing to say that they would never say to somebody's face, they're willing to put, post on social media. And I think that this is kind of a version of, there's just kind of this mob mentality. And once it gets going, it just kind of picks up steam and has a life of its own. And it doesn't produce the best things in us. Uh, when people get swept up in the moment and they don't really even understand what they're doing, how else, what can you, ex how do you explain that? How do you explain that? It says here that many of the people didn't even know why they were in the mob, and yet they were in the mob. It's just odd. Why do, why do people in, in, in mobs throw things and throw things through windows and smash glass and roll over cars? I, I don't know. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. But then again, th I think, I think this, this is something that kind of uh, stokes up our flesh. You know what I mean by that? It just stokes up our flesh. Um, I'm not a very good person to watch hockey games with because I see things with a very distinctly orange lens. And so, but I, I know that. And I know that I'm not particularly objective, especially in the heat of the game. The next day I kind of go, oh man, I got a little carried away. That, oh, that wasn't very good. I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but when our boys were in minor hockey, my wife never sat with me in the stands. I think she just wanted me to have space to move and be myself. And when I did that, she did not want to be associated with me, and I don't blame her. Have any of you ever kind of been like that? You get carried away. And, and so I don't know why mobs become so destructive, but we, we see them on the news on a regular basis. These things still happen. But mobs don't appeal to the thinking person. They appeal to the emotional person. If you don't believe me, you probably have not spent any time watching the news or in social media. So this thing rages for hours. This thing rages on for hours. They're shouting with one voice, even though many don't even know why they're there. And, and this just doesn't make much sense. But mobs, even the ones on the internet, get extreme. And so there was a Jew named Alexander who tried to speak, but he was shouted down. Because, why? Because they found out he was Jewish. So the mob was anti-Semitic. Huh. Surprise. Not really, right? The town clerk finally gets them to listen. And he gives them a politically correct logic when he finally gets up to speak. He affirms that Artemis is wonderful and don't worry about Artemis, she'll be fine. And, and, but he's trying to, to talk them down. And he basically says... Um, be careful what you do from here on because I think the last thing we all want is the Romans to come down and occupy our city. If we're going to have freedom, like if, if, we, if we don't get this thing under control, we are going to be in trouble with Rome. They do not tolerate unrest. And so, so he, he manages to talk them down. And then he reminds them, you have official channels. Demetrius, you have a court system. You can lodge your complaints with the court system, and we have a pro council and we, we have ways of handling things, but mob rule is not one of them. And so, fortunately, they listen to him, and the mob, it says, disperses. But I can't help but think that this is a bit of a picture of our times. The resistance here is real, the resistance is deep, and it's life-threatening. How did people react? How did we react when our living wage was challenged during COVID. How did we react to government restrictions? Many of you saw people get downright mean. When somebody threatens your life and your living and your livelihood, you're going you're gonna to get the, the toughest part of them right back. What prompted rebellion against COVID regulations or health orders? What started the occupation of Ottawa? How did that get started? People's livelihoods were threatened, and they felt that the government wasn't taking care of them, and so they took to the streets. I mean, let's not look back on Ephesus with our snooty noses in the air and pretend we're so civilized and we would never do anything like that. Like, come on. How many of you believe that we're just as capable of a mob and of acting unreasonably and smashing cars and windows as anybody else? All it takes is the right 
attitude. It takes the right circumstance. Come into my home to rob me or do harm to my family. You'll see the ugly side of Glenn. And I hope that that would, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I don't know. I, let's, can we delete that from the stream? I don't know. I, I don't know. There should be something that rises up in us. These, these are really important things. And, and so before we blame this all on the Ephesians, I want us to take a, 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 an honest look at, our, at the gospel that you and I preach, the gospel of Jesus, and reflect back to an illustration of, of, why, uh, of why they react. So just before all this mob thing happens, Luke recorded an embarrassing set of events, a failed deliverance by some Jewish exorcists. Uh, Chris had this in his message. So Sceva is, and this is just in the passage, if you've got your Bibles open, it's just right before the passage we're in, right in the middle of this chapter. And it says Sceva was described as a Jewish high priest. And so while he's ethnically a Jewish man, he doesn't have a Jewish name. And the, the calling of him of the high priest is not like the high priest of the Sanhedrin. He was a high priest of some kind and of some reputation and of some religious order, but it wasn't of Judaism. So you, it's, that, that's not who he was. Um, so chances are um, that this is a, a cult of some kind, maybe even the cult of Artemis. And, uh, and these cult religions often syncretize their pagan rituals and their magic and their beliefs uh, and their theology together. And they became like these, these religious spiritual soups. Uh, and, and whatever kind of work, whatever you thought would work or help or whatever superstition you added to it, that became part of the belief system. And so these cults would try to help people, would try to cast demons out of people. And so when they heard of the name of Jesus and when they heard of the power of, of Jesus being preached by Paul, they thought, well, here's a powerful name of a powerful deity. What should we do? Well, let's just add the name of Jesus to our spiritual soup and make it a little stronger, and maybe we can control the demonic powers that are afflicting people. And so, so remember Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8, 8 when he saw the, the power of God, the laying on of hands, and he tried to buy the power to lay hands on people to have them filled with the Spirit because he saw the power of it. And so that was the mentality that they would have. They would just add it to their system. And quite frankly, if Christianity had been willing to be that kind of a religion and just join the soup, Demetrius would have had no problem. But that's not what Christianity is. And Paul was preaching Christianity, <laughs> Jesus alone, Christ alone. And that's still the gospel that we follow. So occult literature also reveals that they believed that if you knew the name of the spirit, you could, it was almost like a leash. You could name that spirit's name and you could make it work for you. <laughs> and so knowing the name of a spirit was a very big deal to them. And so we can see what was going on here with the sons of Sceva. They'd heard the name of Jesus. They knew it had power. And so when they started their deliverance ministry, they say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches... Get out. Now, here's the scary part. The demon looks back at them and says, Jesus I know. Paul I know. You I don't know. And so he, I was going to say rapes. <laughs> he tears the clothing off and beats these seven men and sends them running out into the streets naked and broken and bleeding. How many of you know that demonic power is real? That spiritual forces in this world are real? And they are. And, you know, here's the interesting thing. Paul isn't debating that they're real. He knows they're real. That's why he says you don't mess around with them. And that's why you don't take the name of Jesus. And so, so here they are out in the streets. And many in Ephesus, so let's put this into a bigger context, many in Ephesus knew about pagan rituals and sacrifice and magic arts and all that sort of stuff, and, and they would have thought that Paul was invoking some form of magic, some form of incantation or ceremonies or rituals that gave human beings power over spiritual beings and over the spiritual realm. But the clear lesson to the Ephesians who came to Christ from Paul was that it's all or nothing. It's only Jesus. 
If you're going to be devoted to and love and serve Jesus, you will walk away from all of those other spiritual things in whatever you were taught. You're walking away from Artemis. You're walking away from magic. You're walking away from incantations and spells and amulets and good luck charms and all of that stuff. You're walking away. You walk away clean. And how do we know that they understood what Paul was saying? Because Chris told us about a multi-million dollar bonfire. Because when the Ephesians got saved... They brought their black magic stuff. They brought their idols. They bought their stones. And they, they burned millions and millions of dollars worth of... Now, if there's millions and millions of dollars worth of stuff to burn, does that give you a sense of how much it was a part of the Ephesian economy? <laughs> Everything you need and want, you could get in, in Ephesus. And it wasn't cheap stuff. So... If we're in spiritual battle today and you say in the name of Jesus, could a demonic spirit say to you today, I don't see Jesus in you. If you interacted with the demonic realm, and I want you to know this stuff is real and that we've done deliverance ministry here in the church and those spirits, when they're under pressure, they will begin to talk to you. And they know who knows Jesus. They see Jesus in the people of God. And so whatever you do, don't be as foolish as the sons of Sceva and say, oh, I know something that'll work. In the name of Jesus, if you're naming the name of Jesus and you're taking on spiritual forces, if you don't have Jesus in you, you may find yourself naked and bleeding in the street. Because that's how this stuff works. The authority that we have comes from Christ. And in Him alone, we have safety and security. So you, can, you get a sense of, once again, what did Luke call this? No small disturbance. The, the forces that are at work here are dramatic. And so we don't add Jesus to our spiritual toolbox when we come to him. Even today, I think people want to use Jesus as just another option among many. And, you know, if the church was happy with that, we would have much broader acceptance in culture and society. Yeah, sure, Jesus is just another way to heaven, just another way to be spiritual. If, if, if that was the gospel, if, that, if we could preach that, the world would have no problem with us, except we can't, because that's not the gospel. You can't create your own Jesus. You can't create your own God. You can't create your own religion. It simply won't work. Jesus is a person, and He is God, and He alone is the Creator, and He alone is the Savior of mankind. And he alone is the risen Lord. And he doesn't share. He doesn't share his people with demonic entities, with ideas, with idols. The Ephesians have this huge bonfire burning their idols and their books. The Paul and Jesus won't allow new believers to keep their Artemis roots is the problem that Demetrius has with Paul and with the gospel. A scholar named Bruce Malona writes, Since the ancient world religion as a social institution was embedded in kinship and in politics, Paul's preaching that dismisses the importance of Artemis and her temple was viewed as a political act, a challenge to political and civil religion, and embedded in this was the economy. So the grievance of Demetrius is that Paul is damaging the domestic, economic, and political life of his city. And he is correct. Isn't he? Isn't he? The gospel is wreaking havoc on the temple of Artemis. People are being converted. Business is going down. And their deity is being under attack. So what did Demetrius really take exception to? He says in his little speech, Paul has said, God's made with hands are not God's at all. Can I say that this is still true? God's of our own making are not God's at all. God isn't who you want him to be, and he's not who you wish he was. God is who he is. And the Bible says those who come to God must believe that he is, they must understand who he is, and you come to him in faith. And you accept He is who He is. He doesn't change for us. He changes us. And so any version of Jesus that isn't true to His Word and isn't Him, His revelation, His real person, isn't the real Jesus. 
the ancients believed that the statue, these idols that they created, was the place for the deity to take residence. So when you smashed or burned an idol, you hadn't killed it. They weren't stupid. They weren't foolish. They just believed that when you smashed or killed that idol, that its place of residence and its place of welcome in your home was now broken. And so it was simply displaced. It had to go. And so when we read through the Old Testament, you remember many times they would cut down the groves of trees and the Ashtaroth, and they'd smash all these things, and they'd smash the relics and smash the temple. Why do you think they were doing that? Because this was the mindset, was that if we destroy the shrine, if we destroy the idol, then the spirit that comes and inhabits it must, be, must leave. And so this is really quite dramatic stuff. So if you wanted to have a, a, a god come and live in your home, you would buy the appropriate idol, and then you would summon it and welcome it and put it in your home somewhere, and you've invited a demonic presence into your home. And that's what Paul would preach against. And that's why when people came to Christ, they would burn all their junk. And so this is why they destroyed these things. Paul affirms the reality of the beings. There are spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. He would write to these the same Ephesians later on. And for some of us here today, we need to hear this. You see, the call of the gospel was to come completely out of all of that spiritual soup, all these ideas these misunderstandings, and come to the God of the Word and accept who He is and believe and trust Him to be exactly who He reveals Himself to be. And we don't get to recreate Him. And so we need to hear that our idols have to go. Well, most of you don't have a little statue sitting on your mantle somewhere in your home. Do you? <laughs> no? Okay, good. That's good. The right answer was no, we don't. Of course not. But what are the idols of our generation? Well, Paul talks about speculations and ideas and, and, and philosophies of men and theologies of demons. I, idols can be the, demon, the, the demonically inspired or humanly inspired ideas that begin to rule the way we see the world. Does that make sense to you? Your worldview. And some of these ideas are idols. There's idols like money and power and fame. Idols like independence. The idea that you can be a self-made man or woman. Perhaps political correctness is an idol in our generation. Or whatever names that you see, whatever concept you see controlling Canadian culture right now, are these manifestations of idols, of demonic ideas that are meant to shape Canadian people, Canadian culture. Because if they are, they're no less idolatrous than the Temple of Artemis was. Is that not true? How many of you believe that there are idols in modern Canada? How many of you realize that you have to struggle against them to not get caught up in the logic and the rationale of them because they, they'll often sound really good. And so no secular idols. I can think of a few like evangelism or rights movements. Some of these are actually good causes. It's just that when they become the central cause and purpose of your life, they can become dangerous to you. And here's the question. What do you believe is the hope of humanity? What do you believe is the salvation of humanity? If you believe that environmentalism and, and zero carbon impact is going to save humanity, that that's going to preserve us for the future, then you don't understand. That's, that's a false God. That's a false hope. That's not where salvation for people is. We're not going to be saved by our science. We're not going to be saved by our philosophy. The only name in heaven, under heaven, by which man can be saved is the name of Jesus. That's what changes us. The problem with humanity is our hearts, and the only thing that can change the heart of a man or a woman is the power of the Spirit of God being made new. So the town... Oops. You don't want to go back to page four, do you? Would you rather I just finish it off? So Paul wasn't worried about stone and wood. He understands, though, that the spiritual doors were being opened to spiritual entities. And so Paul actually mocks these entities that need people to make them little homes, he says. If you remember when he 
he, he talks in, in some of the previous couple or three chapters. In Acts 14, he preaches of the God who made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. And so he's kind of taking a shot over the bow of Artemis. And he says, so if your God needs an idol in order to come and live in and occupy your home, he says, lame. <laughs> I'm talking to you about the God who made the heavens and the earth, who doesn't dwell in temples. It doesn't dwell in pieces of rock and wood. It doesn't dwell in these little images and these little ideas. We're talking about the creator of all that is. And that's who he's calling the people to. And so is he being a little sarcastic? Yeah, yeah, he is. That's exactly what he's being. He's telling them, your small gods don't compare to Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. The Ephesian church was in for a hard road. Paul would get out of there. But in Revelation, we see what happens to this body of believers. In Revelation chapter 2, it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, verse 2, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not. And you found them to be false. They stuck to the word. They stuck to the gospel. They would not compromise for anything, no matter what the cost was. was. He said, you have endured and you have persevered and you have hung on and clung, clung to the truth. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. Well, when we hear about this whole scene in Ephesus, can you imagine what the church faced? Even though Paul got out of there, the church stayed. The people stayed. And this is what they faced. This is, what, this is the city they lived in. And I'm sure they had no easy ride. But Paul reminds them of something that maybe you and I can be reminded of today as well. He says to that same church, but I have this against you, that you've, you've lost your first love. You've left your first love. Therefore, remember what it was like the day you came to know me. Remember your zeal. Remember your passion. Remember the joy of being set free. Remember the joy of being freed from your addictions and from the oppression and things that were on your life. Remember the, the healing work of the Holy Spirit that saved you and changed you and gave you a fresh outlook and a hope for the future. He says, remember and come back to that. It's not just about the struggle against what's evil. It's about embracing who God is and what's good. Are you living to avoid evil and be protected or are you living your life towards Jesus, towards the hope that we have in Him? And so He calls them back. And He says, Yet, I, yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So they resisted, they resisted all that negative stuff. They never compromised, and Jesus commends them for it. I want to just say one more thing. As we talk about how they believed that the spirits would come and inhabit these rocks and these stones and, and these shrines and so on, and this is, the group, this is the people that Paul is talking to. This is the world they've come out of. And I just want to read you something, and I want you to try to hear, pretend that you're a, a first century Middle Eastern person coming out of that perspective and listen to what Paul says. Do you not know that it is your body that is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? <laughs> Isn't that profound? He's saying, God doesn't come and inhabit a little chunk of stone on your mantle or on your coffee table. He comes into you. He regenerates you. He makes you the new creation. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the place where God resides and dwells. I just think that that's so powerful. And I've never, I never knew this before I was studying for this. I never th thought of the context. And he says, but remember, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. Compromise nowhere. Do not allow the spiritual deceptions to become a part of your life. I wonder if sometimes we don't get a little superstitious about our connection with God. Do you have one of those great big Bibles on your coffee table? You know, the big family Bible? Who's got one of those? That used to be what churches gave people who got married. They give you like a 25-pound Bible. 
and you put it on your coffee table. And the reason the man was the priest of the home, he's the only one big enough to carry it. But the question isn't whether you have a Bible in the coffee table or on your bedside table. The question is whether you open it and read it and whether those words come to life in you, right? You see, a Bible on your coffee table isn't protection. Jesus in you is your protection. That's where your life comes from. How many of you are wearing jewelry? How many of you have a, a necklace with a cross on it? That's very nice. Very nice piece of jewelry. Not going to help you battle the spiritual realm, but lovely piece of gold jewelry. <laughs> Hopefully it's nothing more than a reminder of who we are and of where our life began. It began when Jesus died for us on the cross, when he rose again and offered us new life. When we come to church, do we come to meet the presence of the Lord? Our faith isn't an it. It's not a belief system. It's a him. It's Jesus. And for this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. We can come to revere the institution of church more than the God whose presence fills the church. We come to church rather than recognizing that we are the temple. We are the church. Let's not allow our faith ever to become superstitious. Let's not allow our faith to ever be polluted. Our connection is with Jesus. That's why we write... Oh, banner's not up today. That's why we write, be with Him and be like Him. Because that's where we live. That's, that's our hope. Can you bow your heads with me? I can't think of a better day than Mother's Day for you to be born again. <laughs> is there anyone who is here today who has never made a commitment to Jesus as Lord and Savior? You're ready. You're willing to walk away from all the idols and false hopes of this world and you want Jesus. If that's you today, I want to invite you after the service just to come up and have a conversation with me somewhere up at the altar here. We'll be happy to meet with you, talk with you. You may have questions. We'll be happy to answer them if we can or go looking for answers with you. But Jesus is here. And if he's calling to you, don't be like the Ephesians and harden your heart and double down on Artemis. Don't double down on where you've been living, but respond in humility and come before the Lord who will forgive you completely. And he will make you a new man, a new woman today. And for us, as we celebrate Mother's Day, I think of Joshua's words. He said, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, will you stand with me? As for us in our homes, what did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Moms, thank you for helping us find our way through the spiritual journeys of life. Thank you for being willing to be there to love us, to help us. I remember moments when my mother laid hands on me and prayed for me. I remember moments when my mom sat me down and said, I need to repent to you. Here's my mother repenting to her 11-year-old son. She said, I haven't been walking with the Lord the way I need to. And she humbled herself before her son and cried. You don't forget things like that. You never forget the reality of a faith that is shown to you in that way. So moms, today we honor you and we bless you and we thank you for showing us the way. God bless you. Amen. Let's bow and pray. And who's hungry? And smelling that food all morning. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Thank you to the volunteers who have offered to help, to serve and to cook it. They've been working hard. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today. We have hope here today because we have Jesus. Lord, you've given us great examples in our life, moms and spiritual mothers and real mothers who have lived the faith before us. They've taught us and shown us our way. We think of Timothy in the Bible who was taught by his mother and his grandmother about the ways of the Lord. And so, Lord, today we honor and we bless our moms. But, Lord, for all of us, this is a, a journey that we must walk. 
Uh, there are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. There are no offspring. Lord, we come to you one on one. And so this morning, Lord, I just pray that each person here would come to that place of knowing you absolutely convinced, Lord, that you are who you say you are and that they come to know the hope that is in Jesus. We ask for your blessing on the food, on the refreshments that follow. In the name of Jesus, everyone said, Happy Mother's Day. God bless you. You are dismissed.